What if when you heard it's time to sell your car, you heard something happier like flowers, puppies, sunshine, pie? At Echo Park Automotive, we've made it easy to sell your car, so it actually feels like flowers, puppies, sunshine, pie. It feels so much like flowers, puppies, sunshine, pie that you'll wonder why you didn't sell your car. I mean, flowers, puppies, sunshine, pie at Echo Park months ago. See what your car is worth in seconds at echopark.com. The best cars at the best value from the best people. All to make you happier. Echopark.com. And you, and you, and you, and you were there. Some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. Hello, hello. Hello, uh, Brian. Hello, listeners. How is everybody? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing okay. And I'm actually sitting about 20 feet from you. This is the first (laughs) on-site live recording where we're in your new digs down in San Antonio, and I happen to be in town taking care of some business, and so we are recording an episode. But I'm kind of glad we have some distance between us because I don't want you to be able to physically hurt me when I tell you my story. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, after last week uh, where I had to you know, use my brain at least a little bit <laughs> uh, uh, and, and fail in the process, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm already concerned. Well, we want to thank you folks for getting in touch with us for the rates, for the reviews, for checking out the websites. Um, whether you're a, a binge listener like Joe out in Shirts, Texas, who likes to listen when he's working on his lawn or uh, or Marvin in San Antonio, who listens in, uh, every week, uh, as does Brad out in the Bay Area. And we've got a new listener, Byron, out in L.A., who is kind of picking and choosing what he's listening to as he goes through the catalog. Welcome aboard. Thanks for listening to us. Absolutely. Uh, and please uh, like and subscribe and do those things um, on whatever platform you're listening on. Go ahead and give us five stars if you don't mind and go ahead and shoot us a, a review or a comment or a question. Or if you have a curse word you want us to look into some week, uh, we can do that as well. Just fire it off and uh, we will try to respond. Cool. Uh, I believe I go first. This is an even numbered episode, so I get to go first. You are good to go. Brian, I want to talk to you today about the American Chautauqua movement. Are you familiar with this? <laughs> no idea. Okay. Chautauqua. Chita- okay. Chautauqua. Yeah, and we'll get okay. into what that means in a moment. But the Chautauqua movement lasted from 1874 to 1924. And the last 20 of years of that was what they call the heyday of the tent Chautauqua. And allow me to quote from one of my favorite books, Robert Piercy's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, I buy this book every now and then that I read it and give it away to someone who hasn't read it. So I picked this up to go over his his style of Chautauqua. And uh, before I knew it, I'd read 84 pages in it. So I've, I've got to really watch myself when I read this book because I can really lose <laughs> myself in it. Robert Piercy says, I would like to talk in depth about things that seem important. What is in mind is a sort of Chautauqua. That's the only name I can think for it like the traveling tent show Chautauqua that used to move across America, an old time series of popular talks intended to edify and entertain, improve the mind and bring culture and enlightenment to the ears and thoughts of the hearer. The Chautauquas were pushed aside by faster paced radio, movies and television. And it seems to me the change was not entirely an improvement. Perhaps because of these changes, the stream of national consciousness moves faster now and is broader, but it seems to run less deep. Now. This idea of a Chautauqua, a place where you could go to uh, edify yourself, to uh, hear a speech maybe on religion or science or other topics, or maybe watch part of a play or listen to a recital. It starts with the Lyceum, which you may have heard of, which dates to the 1820s, and it lasted until the Civil War. And this is a series of kind of homegrown lectures that folks would put together in a rural area as a form of almost... Uh, continuing education, or in some cases, the only adult education some folks would get. So that's where the the Lyceum started in America. And of course, like a lot of things, the Civil War ended it. So as we get into the 1870s, the Chautauqua movement revived this idea of getting together to discuss big ideas in, in big ways. And this occurred in Lake Chautauqua, New York. And this is sometimes known as the Mother Chautauqua, 
and the little Chautauquas that came later were known as the daughter Chautauquas, but it was an attempt at betterment through intellectual and spiritual pursuits. There might be scientific lectures, religious activities, musical performances, dramatic readings and plays, uh, sports and physical activities. Lake Chautauqua one summer, for example, had a baseball game every day at three o'clock. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Great. I, I kind of like to think of this as a carnival of the mind, but carnival is kind of scary. Carnivals can be scary. And circus of the mind, I believe, is a Vedic term, so I don't want to use that. So I think Chautauqua, like Piercing, is probably the best way to describe this. It's sort of an ecumenical Christian uh, religion that's throughout. You might have Methodist speakers, evangelicals. You might have people who are speaking more to the American character as opposed to religious themes. But this idea was started, the idea of the tent Chautauqua, was started by a guy named Keith Vauter and Roy Ellison, later by a fellow named White, um, so a lot of these are known as the Ellison White Years. They started a tent Chautauqua where it would caterpillar from town to town. So let's say you start in one town, your day one performers, when they're done, they immediately get on a train and go to the next town and start a day one in a new city. And meanwhile, in the old city, day two is going. So you kind of jump your way across America, inching your way oh, across nice, yeah. like a caterpillar. Yeah. And for 20 years, this tent model flourished in America using the railways mainly um to bring to rural areas this idea of uh community education and getting together to discuss big ideas and big things some of the lecturers among some of the lecturers were drew pearson not the wide receiver for the dallas cowboys (laughs) but (laughs) the (laughs) the uh famous washington columnist who wrote about politics in his washington merry-go-round a fervent uh uh, anti-mccarthyite uh, could not stand Joe McCarthy. Drew Pearson lectured with some of these when he was a younger man. Jane Adams of Hull House in Chicago. Eugene V. Debs. Theodore Roosevelt. William Howard Taft. Woodrow Wilson. Walter Lippmann, the great Walter Lippmann. If you've studied any communication history, you might recognize that. As you might recognize Ida Tarbell, one of the great journalists from the mm-hmm, early part sure. of the century. And mm-hmm. Edna Ferber. Now, two of the biggest people that I want to talk about, one you've probably heard of and one you know of, have you ever heard of Russell Conwell? No. Russell Conwell was a Baptist minister, and he was a Yale graduate, and he had three separate enlistments in the Union Army during the Civil War. He would get injured, then he signed right back up. He started off as an enlisted man and wound up a lieutenant colonel by the time the war was over. And he gave a very famous lecture, and he gave it some 6,000 times on the Chautauqua (laughs) circuit. It was called Acres of Diamonds. And while this isn't as as graspy as, say, the the prosperity movement in evangelical religions, it focused on the pursuit of wealth through hard work. And he referred to the inheritors of wealth, folks folks who had generational wealth, as poor, weak, and (laughs) lily-fingered. It was all about hard work, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, getting hard work done, and reaping the rewards financially. He made about uh, anywhere between $100, $500 a lecture. He would take out his expenses. Yeah, right. And he would take out, but he would take his expenses out, his room and board, wherever he was staying, his meals. The remainder of the fee would go to a promising young man. It was a a young man who was attending college as as a form of scholarship. So this guy was about kind of giving back as well. From an excellent book I read for this this, uh, particular piece I'm doing here, um, Victoria Case and some contributions by her husband, Robert Orman Case. We called it Culture, the Story of Chautauqua from, from 1948. I use the Kindle edition. Case says that this arrangement that Conwell made of sending money back was the Ivy League's single greatest contribution to the youth of rural America. <laughs> um, probably, probably still true. Um, and he's best known, Russell Conwell, is he founded a little place called Temple College in Philadelphia, which eventually became Temple University. Mm-hmm, sure. Um, so that was kind of his contribution to it. And this idea that Acre of Diamonds, this would be a generational thing where, like, over the 20-year period, one guy had heard it when he was in his late teens, so he brought his son 10 years later to hear the same speech. That's how popular this was. Now, the second the second fella here uh, that was one of the biggest lecturers for the Chautauqua circuit, at least for the Ellison White Chautauquas, was a fellow by the name of William Jennings Bryan. And I'm sure we all recognize that name, an American orator, lawyer, three-time presidential candidate. 
he his fame began really in the 1896 speech at the Democratic National Convention. This is something I think the first place I ever heard this was our old drama teacher, John O'Neill, was talking about this this uh, speech where he rallied against the gold standard. Um, William Jennings Bryan, not our old high school teacher, John <laughs> O'Neill, um, where he said, you shall not press upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon this cross of gold. He felt that silver was a much better way to back our money system in America. And he, as I said, he he failed three times to, to become president, but he did try. He was by far the most popular and highest paid Chautauqua lecturer. And he became entwined with the fate of the Chautauqua. As Case points out, they were born in the same time period of America, and they died the exact same year, 1924. Um, at the time of his death, he had been some four days removed, William Jennings Bryan, from the famous Scopes Monkey Trial on Evolution, oh, wow. which he he won, but he he died four days later. Wow. Um, there were attempts to spread this idea of the Chautauqua to other parts of the world. The Canadian attempt, and I love this, um, shout, shout out to my sister-in-law, Veronica, uh, who's a, a persnickety Canadian, marked by the most Canadian response ever with not liking the term Chautauqua. They said, well, we like this idea, but we don't like the name Chautauqua because it didn't have any you know, correlation. They couldn't trace it anywhere. Right, so sure. instead, they, were, they refer to these events as Canadian fall festivals. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> The Australian and New Zealand campaigns were an absolute disaster for a variety of reasons. Um, they never quite took off. The, uh, there were some uh, labor issues with Australia and New Zealand. They didn't like the idea that these guys would come in and, and take their money basically back to America once they made, you know, once they did their stuff. Um, so that didn't really fail. And by 1924, it had started to die out because of radio, because of other things, because right. there was an explosion of other people copying it. And quite frankly, because of, um, I guess you might say a lot of urban intellectuals found the movement to be simplistic and condescending. And ultimately the voice of the people became kind of the standard lesser lectures were introduced and all of these things contributed to the end of the American Chautauqua as we knew it. Now, um, there was a brief mini revival of the Chautauqua movement in the late 1970s. In of all places, New York City's East Village. Hmm. It was centered around, uh, do you remember CBGB, the punk? Yeah, sure. Of course, yeah. yeah, it was centered around the music venue CBGB. And one band in particular stood out as being the epitome of this style of Americana. Ramones? Get... No, Brian, not at all. Okay, <laughs> Sherman, yet. haven't you ever heard of Chautauqua Heads? Oh, seriously? Huh? No, no I'm fucking <laughs> oh, with you're, you. No. You're fucking with okay. I was like, that was my Mr. Yeah, Peabody. Yeah. That was my Mr. Peabody <laughs> joke. You nailed me. I strained, I strained forever to come up with a pun of Chautauqua, 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 <laughs> Chautauqua Heads. <laughs> See, see what I'm doing there? Yeah, okay. I got this, you. this is yeah. what I'm glad you're in the other room so you can't hit me. Now, there are still destination Chautauquas today. Uh, we have one, well, I was going to say not far from here, but when I'm back home in Colorado, we have one up in Boulder called the Colorado Chautauqua. Um, it, it began life in 1898 as the Texas Colorado Chautauqua Association. And that was an attempt to provide summer curriculum for Texas teachers, but put them in a much cooler climate. Mm hmm. Instead of suffering through something in the middle of a Texas summer, it was it was a whopping seventy five dollars for a six week session. But that it did include lectures, uh, room and board, food, and train fare from with a one hundred mile radius of Fort Worth. So it was a chance for young educators to get better educated by coming up to Colorado for uh, you know a month and a half. Right. Sure. Uh, there's a group called the New Old Time Chautauqua, and I think it's based out of New York State. It just finished July tour, so it was a touring Chautauqua in areas of Washington state. And of course, the mother of them all is still there, Lake Chautauqua, New York. Um, and I think we know the recent history of this. You know what happened there recently? No. On August 12th, author Salman Rushdie was attacked oh, at the mother Chautauqua in New York. Yep. That's where and, I, this term rang a bell a little bit. I yep. couldn't, okay, I, I, I got it now, I mean, okay. This is just what, uh, almost a month ago, it left him on a ventilator. I believe he's off the ventilator, but I think he did lose sight in one eye. 
Right. Um, and it was a horrible assault and everybody looked at it for what it was. And it was a horrible assault on this author and thinker and, and lecturer and educator. But it's also a, it's also an assault on the whole institution of the Chautauqua itself. This idea of getting together as a public community to right, learn sure. something different. Uh, you could argue it was, an, it was just as much an attack on public intellectualism and the free exchange of ideas, the free exchange of enlightenment and education as it was an attack. Now, to him, it's a much more it's a serious attack, right. but it can be, it little, can be a, both. A tad right? more personal, yeah. It can be both. Um, and, and I guess where I look at Chautauqua is, I guess the critical way to think about things is, was this egalitarian in its nature? Because I can't get any information, or I couldn't from what I looked up, on, say, if folks of color were allowed to attend these, because we're dealing with the Reconstruction period, we're dealing right. with, uh, it is in Pro the North. Probably so... not. I mean, prob it was probably all white men, um, just based on history and that time period. But Yeah, and, and so I don't know to what extent it reached out to folks who wouldn't normally be able to be part of that particular um, public venue. But I guess my question is, is how can we make the end goal of the Chautauqua a reality outside of the modern Chautauquas we have, this idea that we have this civil discourse. In the words of Victoria and uh, Victoria Case and her husband Richard Case, how are we able to express the public or civic consciousness? And their argument is that when the Chautauqua died, we really started to lose that sense of public and civic duty and consciousness to one another. Mm -hmm. And I think the obviously parallel, I mean, this is kind of the way the internet was sold to us, right? That it was going to be a place <laughs> yeah. that was a free market, free market right. ideas. Doesn't right. matter what you look like, who you are. If you come to it. Levels, levels the playing field for everyone. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. Well, and of course we know that that's never the case with new media. Right. I mean, it always goes through a cycle of the very, the technocrats and the very wealthy have access to things first. And I'm sure that's, I mean, the Chautauqua, to go to the Chautauqua and Mother Chautauqua, New York in the night in 1874, it wasn't cheap, right? I mean, it cost money and time to go there. So it's not like it's this all, all consuming chance for everyone to be able to express themselves and participate. I mean, the only media I can think of that were able to do that really for folks were the movies and the penny press when the penny press came around mm -hmm, that was right. affordable from the vast majority for the for the vast majority of people. Um, anyway, that's a brief look at the American Chautauqua. I think it's one of the great uh, one of the great institutions that because that, we think about traveling circuses, traveling carnivals. How about the traveling Chautauqua as we had it once upon a time where you could go every day and hear a new public lecture. You could participate and watch a play, hear a musical recital you might normally hear, hear people talk from around the world. Um, anyway, that's that's what I have to be, say about the American Chautauqua. I think it's something that I probably would have tried to go to if I were living in 1874. Or oh, right. Absolutely. I, I mean, you know, public discourse and a, you know, free exchange of ideas. The, the only thing that, that comes to mind that might be somewhat similar, and I say only somewhat, there is the uh, Texas Lyceum. And you, and you mentioned okay. Lyceum. Yeah. yeah right, so, right, right. So, so the Texas Lyceum um, is something of a springboard for folks who have i think political aspirations um i've known two or three people i um, actually eddie um eddie rodriguez who's the texas state rep for near east austin is a, is a buddy of mine he's very, been, been very involved in texas lyceum uh, and i have a couple other friends that were, worked in public policy who i mean it was sort of this traveling event sort of like the you know state democratic convention where there'd be a, a a weekend event in different cities that was more more broad than just um political affiliations and those types of things it was more more intellectually more intellectually based with a bent toward slight bent toward politics and public policy perhaps um but it was definitely much more of a exchange of ideas let's all get together and you know, try to learn something. And it, it was much, I judge it's much, much less about drawing boundaries, drawing lines, being partisan and more about sharing ideas and being cooperative. That's an excellent example. I hadn't come across the Lyceum, but it's, it's hard for me to distinguish between the two. I think the original Lyceum was much more homegrown, like in the town they did it. 
as opposed to the Chautauqua where it would eventually come to your town or you would have it travel to their town to visit right, the Chautauqua right, right. sites. So the, the Lyceum, I, I mean, I still think it's an excellent idea. And, and I didn't know about the Texas Lyceum. That's that's spectacular. Yeah, I mean, it may, it may, in this day and age especially, I mean, anything that that is a free and exchange of of information that isn't about um, you know, me, me versus you, I think it's, I think it's a worthy <laughs> endeavor because everything, I mean, I mean, more, more now than at any point in either one of our lives, our thing, our, our battle lines are just drawn on absolutely fucking everything. Um, and, and there's no, no nuance, no subtlety, no gray. There's a, you know, you know, if you, either you like the Cowboys, if you, if, if you don't like the Cowboys, you're pawn scum. There's no, I mean, everything, <laughs> even, even sports allegiances have this crazy, um you know fervency to it it's just insane yeah and i would like to get to that idea of a more verdant and fair society and and it would be nice to see if we could have something along the lines of this that could exist uh again someday it would be nice well, be you're, it, you're, you're, obvi you're obviously a socialist but you know. well i am uh, uh you know be it in lyceum form or chautauqua form my sources for this piece were Robert Piercy's 1974 book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, An Inquiry into Values, the William Morrow Modern Classics Edition, Victoria Case and Richard Orman Case 1948 book, we called it Culture, the Story of Chautauqua on Kindle, Chautauqua.com, which is the Colorado Chautauqua, Chautauqua.org, which is the new old Chautauqua I mentioned, the one that traveled through Washington State this last summer, and chq.org, the mother Chautauqua institution in Lake Chautauqua, New York, and Wikipedia for some basic facts and ideas. And that is one of my ongoing fascinations, not only with uh, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, but this idea of the American free exchange of ideas in the form of Chautauqua. Awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. And one really bad talking heads joke, which fell really, <laughs> really flat. Which I, I was, I was not thinking. I, I, I forgot who, I forgot who was talking to me for, <laughs> for just a second. At some book, at some point, he's going to do something really stupid, <laughs> like a pun on seventies new wave punk bands. It'll be awful. Yes, it's it's virtually assured. <laughs> All right, we're gonna shift gears here. You ready? Yep. It's time for the Dream Idiot's Curse Word of the Week. All right. So I don't mean to um, don't mean to offend, but would you mind if I called you Mr. Irrelevant? No, but... <laughs> if, if, if I dubbed you Mr. Irrelevant 2023? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I wouldn't find it. I wouldn't find it offensive at all. I mean, okay. if it's the term I'm thinking of. Well, now, in your in your case, in your case, I guess it would be doctor irrelevant. Um, <laughs> this is this is ringing a bell, is it? It is. It's a term used to describe certain fo certain fellows picked in the NFL draft, right? It's the NFL yes, draft. So, uh, I, I, yes, I, I I had not heard this until uh, recently. So last year's Mister Irrelevant was a guy named Brock Purdy, uh, who was a quarterback drafted by I believe by Washington. Um, I went back a, a few years. I mean, there's there's virtually no one on this list of Mr. Irrelevance who are people you will have heard of. Um, 1991, it went <laughs> the word went to a guy named Wanky, Larry Wanky. Uh, I don't know what, what 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 position he played, but I just wanted to say Wanky. Um, <laughs> it's a good thing his first name wasn't Harry, I guess. Um, and the only one that might ring a bell, um, I always want to say his last name is Suckup. I know it's pretty, his name is actually Ryan Sukup or Sukup. Oh yeah, he just yeah, won yeah. a Super Bowl, right? Yeah, he he won a yeah. Super Bowl with the, with the Chiefs a couple of years ago. I played with the I almost said the Marlins. That he's a talented guy. If he played with the Marlins, he played <laughs> with the Ravens, I believe, uh, for, for a while as well. And so, if you are Mister Irrelevant, you are the the very last NFL pick every year. Uh, and if you win this dubious award, you you and your family are apparently are flown out to California and spend a week at Disneyland and have all these weird celebrations. Uh, it's sort of it's not really even formally sanctioned by the NFL, as far as I can tell. It's this you know this guy started it, and it's sort of informally connected to the NFL. But 
you know, players and even franchises kind of compete to get once you're once you're you know down there at the dregs of the draft, they will actually sort of compete to to get the last pick until the uh, commissioner weighed in a few years ago and said, yeah, cut it out, just you know, <laughs> you know, pick your pick and you're and you're you know you're good to go. So, Mister Irrelevant, the other um the other prize that is similar to this, which I didn't uh, know about, is so the Tour de France has. The yellow jersey for the overall um, leader, uh, the polka dot jersey, is for King of the Mountains. There's the, I think it's like a hot pink jersey if you're the leader in sprints. But there also is a competition for the person to come in dead last in the Tour de France. And once, yeah. and once riders in the Tour de France realize that they're out of contention for the more prominent awards, they will engage in all kinds of tactics to try to finish last <laughs> in, in, including trying to sneak off you know fall off the back and then like stop and like wander into a bar and hang out for a few minutes <laughs> <laughs> so anyway apparently you know some folks do you know once once a victory is is you know deemed impossible they will happily take last place I just so they're they're of... pulling a reverse Rusi, rosie ruiz instead of uh yes cheating in the marathon you're <laughs> Cheating, cheating, cheating to lose. I don't know. Just sort of interesting and, and sort of funny to me. So yeah, that's that's professor irrelevant to you. So. There you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's so a good one. So back a few weeks ago, uh, episode twenty eight, I think we talked about the opening lines of novels. And I rattle off a whole a whole bunch of them and quiz you a little bit on some of those. And um, there was one of those that I, I was convinced was the opening line for a novel, but I couldn't find it. And then uh, I did happen to stumble across a reference to it. So uh, there is a line in, in, there's an opening line of one of the chapters, not the first chapter, one of the chapters in, in Casino Royale begins with the, with the, with the uh, sentence James lit his 70th cigarette of the day oh, I, was okay. gonna, I, was, I was convinced that one of them one of them actually started uh, James Bond stepped outside and whatever but I, I didn't have it right but someone someone wrote in and, and told me um, told me the the correct answer to that but uh, along those same lines we're not doing books we're gonna do I'm gonna I'm gonna run down a few of the better known more you know, memorable, more whatever, uh, closing lines from motion pictures. Some of these you will know. Some of them, okay. some of them might stump you, although you keep surprising me with the random shit that you know. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I have no idea whether, whether you will do well, well on this or not. So, well, that was my minor in college. I was torn between <laughs> psychology and then and random, random shit. shit random and, shit. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, a few of these. Yeah, pretty obvious um okay so the line is louis i think this is the, is the beginning of a beautiful friendship that's casablanca uh-huh uh, okay the line is the horror the horror oh that's um bambi no um... oh no 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 that's <laughs> is that apocalypse now yes uh-huh. okay all right so those, those are those are better known perhaps more obvious okay the line is I never had any friends later on like the ones I had when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? Stand by me? Oh, he's three for three. <laughs> yep. Okay. okay, so this one's a little bit longer. The line is, I have to wait around like everyone else. Can't even get decent food. Right after I got here, I ordered some spaghetti with marinara sauce, and I got egg noodles and ketchup. I'm an average nobody. I get to live the rest of my life like a schnook. That would be the great late Ray Liotta, uh, Ray Liotta from uh, Goodfellas. That's yep. Why Goodfellas? Yeah. Uh, this one I did not know, and so it seems a little bit more obscure. The line is, "A man's got to know his limitations." Old man in the sea. I have no idea. <laughs> it's a uh, Clint Eastwood Magnum Force. That that line is fairly famous, but Mag- I've never heard of Magnum Force before in my entire life. It was, I think, the second Dirty Harry movie or third. Yeah, I knew, I knew it was in the yeah. Dirty Harry. Like, okay, whatever. Yeah, it's then, it's then... it's like the least. Yeah, that one's not one people talk about a lot. Man's got to know his limitations. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, next one. The line is, I'm the boss. 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 I'm the boss, 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 boss. No idea. And it's not, boss, it's not boss baby. Um, Raging Bull. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. The line is, I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. That is Sounds of the Lambs, <laughs> right? Sir Anthony yeah. Hopkins. Okay. Yep. Correct. Okay. The line is, nobody's perfect. Great film, older film. Oh, that is, um, oh, well, nobody's perfect. It's um, Some Like It Hot. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Some Like It Hot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is a great film. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, next one. The line is, you met me in a, <laughs> you met me in a very strange time in my life. In this movie, when it first came out, I did not like it, but came, I came to like it a lot you know 10 years later um man i i can't place it i know the line but i i, I can't that is it's not fight club is it it's not fight yeah it club. is yep oh it is, it is. oh yeah. wow okay yep step backwards into a lucky pile of horse shit for that one <laughs> all right next one the line is i was cured all right Oh, that's Clockwork Orange, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you're crushing this. I've I've lost track of. I think you missed one. Yeah, I think I missed uh, two. Uh, the line is "Mine Fiora, I can walk." Oh, that's uh, um, Doctor Strange Love or how I yeah, yeah, yeah. stop <laughs> worrying and love the bomb. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Shit, you're crushing it. Uh, okay. The line is this place. <laughs> This place makes me wonder, which would be worse, to live as a monster or to die as a good man? Young Frankenstein. I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, I, I have a great line. I have not seen this movie. Shutter Island. Oh, I've never. Yeah, I've not seen that. I've read the book, but I've not seen the movie. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's in that, I yes. think, right? Yeah, okay. yeah uh, and I forget... Tim Robbins, maybe I forget who else. Uh, okay, the line is one more thing, Sophie. Is she aware her daughter is still alive? That is from Kill Bill Volume One. <laughs> yep. Is that right? Damn. Okay. Yes, that's right. Damn. Okay. Uh, I just rewatched really right. that one because one of my sons was like, Oh, I want to watch a Tarantino film. Okay, let's just go jump right in with Kill Bill. So, <laughs> okay. That's. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's probably fine. Um, they, they are his his stuff is just like I remember watching like Pulp Fiction, just thinking how I mean could this be more violent? I don't think so. Yes. All right, next one. The uh, the line is life is a state of mind. Uh and and I know this is a movie you have seen and a movie you like. Life is a state of mind main character is walking across a pond or a lake at the end oh it's it's uh yeah, it's being there <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i gave you that yeah, I, I wouldn't have gotten it if you hadn't given yeah it it i thought i was maybe going to go for whose life is it anyway or one of the more depressing movies but yeah being there is well being there's i can't, can't believe i missed that <laughs> pretty pretty depressing yeah that's there's a whole bunch of like media stuff going on and then you hear the yeah and he's, he walks off that's good right. stuff uh, all right. The line is, I'm not even going to swat that fly. I hope they're watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know and they'll say why she wouldn't even harm a fly. Monster? Oh, good guess. No. Nope. Mary Poppins. <laughs> the sound of music. No. <laughs> that was my next guess. Psycho. Oh, damn it. Okay. Uh, this one you'll you'll know. No I'm pressure. Flaming out at the end, Brian. Yeah, you're, 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 you're petering out. Uh, you maniacs! You blew it up. Damn you! God damn you all to hell! <laughs> God damn you all to hell! That's Planet of the Apes. Yeah, it's a stupid fucking movie. The stupid fucking Charlton. 
Um, all right, next one. The Dead. line is... Sorry, go ahead. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. Bueller? Yeah. Bueller? Bueller, right. Bueller? Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> my, fa- I think my favorite bit from that is when he says... Um, What's the score? It's tied. Oh, who's winning or something like that? The principal. What he's, what's he's watching the Cubs game? What's the score? It's tied one one. Oh, who's winning? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Next one. Line is Ernest Hemingway once wrote, "The world is a fine place and worth fighting for." I agree with the second part. Hemingway once wrote, "The world, the world mm-hmm. is a fine place, and worth fighting for." I agree. Um, with the second part. That would be Boogie Nights. <laughs> no, nope. okay. What is it? Seven. Oh, you know, damn it! I was going to rewatch that the other night. It's a good, good, good movie. Uh, not that funny, but pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so, so apparently, I I saw some interview in passing with. Um, I can't think what, what movie it would have been for, but it was you know, an interview with Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie, I think. Or I, can't, I can't think what movie they were they were in together recently, but whatever. And uh, someone was asking Pitt, what what lines do fans run up and yell at you when they see you on the street? <laughs> uh, and he says that all, I mean, all, the, one, the one he gets apparently the most is people will, will, will see him or yell, yell across the street, what's in the box? What's in the box? Yeah. <laughs> uh listener of the listener of the pod joe once got in trouble and joe i know you're listening to this because an old buddy of ours the the late great Chaz, uh he really wanted to see seven so they went to go see it and he told he told joe he said look joe i don't want any talking to this movie i really want to see this i think i I don't know why but i really i I will get up if he starts talking i will get up and move and the credits start and it says starring brad pitt and joe says oh brad pitt and charles gets up and walks about five five rows down it sits in the middle and just ignores him for the rest of the movie (laughs) yeah fair enough (laughs) he warned him he warned him he deserved it yeah (laughs) Uh, all right, next one. The line is, "What's in the box?" <laughs> seven. No. Oh, we already, we already covered seven. Oh, uh, scary movie two. I don't know. I'm Barton Fink. Oh, great, great, great movie. Been a while since seen that one. Yeah, but great, great film. Uh, next one. All right, Mister Demille, I'm ready for my close up. That would be uh, Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the line is, I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are still truly good at heart. The Diary of Anne Frank? Yep, not that funny. Or is that or is that one kid in high school mispronounced it? The Dairy of Anne Frank? Do you remember <laughs> that? When do we get out of here? When do we get out of here? Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, or, or as um, someone else, we... Um, we know kept kept referring to it as the diarrhea of Anne Frank. Yes. <laughs> um, next one is closing line, last line of this movie. The line is "fuck." <laughs> um, it's a wonderful life. <laughs> <laughs> the Muppets take Manhattan. Um... <laughs> oh, pay me. Fuck. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Eyes wide shut. Oh, okay. I've seen that exactly half a time. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Anything with, with Tom Cruise, I have to avoid. So skip that one. And last one. No pressure. You'll you'll know this one. The line is I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. Hope I can make it across the Pacific. I hope I can make it across the border. The border. I hope to see. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. That would be Andy Dufresne, mm. Shawshank Redemption. Okay. Yep. Man, I was about to say like uh, the flight log of 
Amelia Earhart or something really bad. I, I, I just, <laughs> then I then I heard then I heard Morgan Freeman's voice in my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can't really do impressions. Otherwise, you know, I would have tried, but I like to think I can, and then I can't. So I won't. <laughs> I won't try that. As, as as we've shown on this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> WC who feels what? <laughs> what? All right, uh, there you have it. I think you missed four out of say out of. I don't know. It was. I it was a. Count. It got humiliating yeah. there in the middle. Yeah. So. It it is really great to have a final line that just capstones a novel or a film that just feels like a um you know sometimes it's a punch to the gut and mm. uh, other times it's uh you know it's just th- that amazing combination of uh words and moving pictures can just really knock you off your feet right oh yeah sure yeah um, um go ahead no uh i was just i I was working on a similar premise and I was going to do one eventually on the opening lines of movies. Well, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've got a list of exactly one. <laughs> um, it was the best of times. It was the worst of no way. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what it was, but I can't remember now. Uh, yeah, just this, the, the, the way that film can be wrapped up, like the Ray, the Ray Liotta bit at the end of Goodfellas mm-hmm. is just, absolutely perfect of everything that went wrong so um, right oh yeah yeah uh good stuff man good stuff the um i have no idea what the what the last line of um from titanic was but actually i do recall vividly seeing that film in the theater and uh walking out right afterwards and i was walking right behind a mother with probably 14 15 year old daughter um and obviously titanic was three and a half hours long four hours long and uh over over the daughter say say to the, to the mom if i known the titanic was going to sink at the end i wouldn't have come <laughs> oh, <laughs> student of history <laughs> it's like it's like that simpsons episode where the kids are running out for summer dismissal and the history teacher comes out and says wait wait we didn't finish our unit on world war ii we won, and the kids are still crazy. <laughs> ah. <sighs> All right, folks. Yeah, uh, that was way more fun than the uh, that that other guy that that comes on here and does those stupid college rhyming games. That was much better <laughs> than that dumbass rhyming game one. Yeah, that that one last week gave me a migraine. I was like, oh, <laughs> fabulous. Um, I did have one um current event item news item um out there and uh, you know we may periodically you know um not every episode maybe just occasionally but i keep coming across uh stories that i see in the news that are worth um ridiculing and mocking mercilessly and so this is one of those cases um have you ever heard of the uh term nitrogen hypoxia um I, I want to say I have, but I don't know for <laughs> sure. I've heard of okay. nitrogen narcosis, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, not quite the same thing. So we're headed to that that hotbed of intellectualism and, and social justice. that is the great state of Alabama. Roll Tide. Um, nitrogen hypoxia is being considered in uh, Alabama as a means of execution. So there he is right now, a man on death row in in Alabama. Uh, his name is Alan Eugene Miller. Uh, he is set to be executed on September 22nd, so this week. Um, and you know, I'm not a you know diehard lefty crazy liberal where I don't think people should be punished. This guy's a he's, he's a bad dude. He killed three people in a workplace shooting in 1999. He's an awful human being. I am fervently, passionately against the death penalty. And this is not a, not a situation where there's any question about the man's guilt. But as you may have read a few, a few years ago, there have been a number of instances in the last, I want to say, three years where lethal injections went spectacularly awry. Uh, and the reason lethal injection is done is because it's allegedly humane or you know whatever, pain-free or something. And a couple of instances went awfully wrong, you know, went, went really, really badly. 
this guy says that he opted in for nitrogen hypoxia because it's now been approved in Alabama, Oklahoma, and Mississippi as a means of execution, even though no one has ever used it. It has never been done. And so um, nitrogen hypoxia basically is, you know, the air that we breathe is like 78% nitrogen and 20% oxygen and the rest is helium and hydrogen, methane and other and other things. You can kill a person via this means by basically ramping up the nitrogen and, and sucking out the oxygen. Um, nitrogen is inert, but when you don't have oxygen, you will die. So this is basically killing someone with a pillow as far as i can tell this is asphyxiation uh and the reason this dumbass requested it apparently is because he has a fear of needles like dude you're you're, you know your random fears (laughs) don't seem that relevant i mean it's cruel and unusual either way but my general impression is that lethal injection is at least comparatively humane if you are if you are deprived of oxygen uh, in this way, just imagine being underwater in a pool uh, and not being able to breathe. So at sea level, if there's twenty percent oxygen, you know a mile up, like where you live, you know it can get, get down to sixteen percent, where breathing can become difficult. At four or five percent, you can you know enter into a coma and then you'll die. But this takes many, many, many seconds, uh, and so. I don't know. I just saw this in the news and I was like, they're going to do what? Uh, of course, in Texas, you know, if your IQ here is the same as your waist size, they'll execute you um, because they just don't. I mean, uh, you know, in this country, allegedly, you have the right to not be subjected to cruel or unusual punishment. And increasingly, it just feels like the cruelty is the point. And this just feels like an unbelievably cruel thing that is that, that may become reasonably common. It probably won't become the standard, but I'm just blown away that this is even being considered. It, it's almost like backing a pickup truck up to the room where they're in, putting a garden hose in the exhaust pipe and running that under the door would be better. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that that's probably similar. I mean, uh, I mean, um, you know, I don't, I've never witnessed that. Um, I think execution is just reprehensible. I, I, I can see how perhaps if I had a family member that was the victim of a horrendous crime, I would want some awfully vengeful punishment. Maybe I don't think that I would. I don't. I, I could. I can't conceive of a scenario in which I'd want to witness an ex- witness an execution. Um, you know, people in Texas especially think this is incredibly important uh and i'm just you know endlessly blown away by the fact that this is something that we do considering it is irrefutable that there there have been dozens potentially hundreds of people who have been executed over you know decades and decades because law enforcement is corrupt and terrible and lazy and people get convicted of crimes and then after you've executed them there's nothing you can fucking do about it when you find out that they that they weren't actually the, the culprit so you know making you know grinding the knife in even, even worse so to speak is this thing where your lungs are going to fucking explode uh and you know i don't know this guy you know, you know eugene miller is obviously a bad human being but he's still a human being he still has rights and uh i just i'm stunned that this is a thing and uh you know, i'm just trying to trying to imagine also you know the french revolution and was it louis, louis the 15th or louis the 16th that was what that was guillotined and him you know i'm, I'm imagining him trying to say he, he well, was louis the he was louis the 15th and the 16th <laughs> I, i'm just I mean, imagine i'm mean, trying to imagine him or someone like that saying well i have i have a fear of big shiny knives that go shunk. <laughs> like, like no uh i mean you can't you know I don't get why this guy has requested this, but uh, because it just sounds fucking awful. Uh, I mean, by all means, you know, okay, Alabama, build a guillotine. That's more humane. Well, some guys, some some guys have requested in in states where it's still, uh, you know, firing squad is still, we'll we'll take the firing squad because it's a bigger spectacle because it's, it really gets in your face as to look what they're doing. It's not a matter of putting a needle in an arm. They're putting a bullet in someone's heart as opposed to a needle in the arm. 
and it's much more uh, visceral. It's much more bloody and and um, confrontational about you're taking the state is taking someone's life, right? Right, and I, part of me says if we're going to do this, and we shouldn't, because I'm like you. Let's make it horrible and gross. I mean, let's <laughs> let's show people what it's. I mean, let's, he's man, going let's, to, put, let's, put, he's go- let's put it on Fox. This is, this is reality TV. He's the, going to sleep. Square. He's not going to sleep. You're paralyzing him and stopping his heart is what you're doing. Right. And I, I don't know. I'm also picturing going the route that I suggested with the car engine and, and running the hose under the door. Uh-huh. And then it failing and the other guy saying something like, that's what you get for driving a Chevy. <laughs> right. Nah, it's just awful. Just another example. Yeah, it's just a, yeah, just a, just a train wreck. And, 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 and the thing I also just, I still can't believe that, you know, that we will tell someone, okay, Timmy, and it's time for us to, we're going to give you that magic shot that, that sends you to sleep, sleep, because there are people that are so mentally damaged and with IQs, you know, below 70 who have been executed in this state, uh, mm-hmm. who likely have no fucking idea what's going on. Um, uh, but well, we, that's, this is Texas, you know, don't mess with Texas. Bang, bang, bang. We've got to have some justice. Uh, and, and we have, you know, ass fucks like, uh, Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz, um, fuck Ted Cruz, by the way. I mean, I mean, ass <laughs> fuck in the best possible sense of the word, by the way, but so anyway, <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> so, but, um, Google this, you know, just go on Google, type in nitrogen hypoxia, uh, on the, on the 22nd, this guy is supposed to be executed by some means. Uh, and I'll be very curious to see if this is this, you know, simple benign little procedure or whether it is completely awful. I'm betting it's going to be the latter. I think it uh, is too. I think you're right. Yeah, but anyway, this, um, most of this comes from an NPR article that came out last week on the 13th by um, Ayana Archie. But there's there are many many articles about you know about this uh, out there. Well, thank you, Brian. I'll have to look that up. That's a that is a that's a that's a brutal one. Yeah. Um, and and with that in mind, l- let me say that today's story I put together something a little lighthearted. <laughs> especially compared to what we just did. But uh, in uh, uh, we got pretty serious last week as well. And so I want to do something kind of lighthearted this week for my story. And I'm going first. So I'm going to get going. Um, Brian, have you ever thought about the similarities between baseball players and musicians on tour? Have I thought about that? Um, I have not thought about that. Now that you mentioned, I can see how there there could be some similarities. You've got a lot of, lot, you know, you're on the road. You've got to get, deal with the group dynamics of of living, working, performing, and traveling to the same bunch of people, the lulls of boredom, boredom in between, even when you're doing gigs. So what I'd like to do to, today, tonight, now, is present to you some stories of things that jazz musicians have tried to do while performing or on the road. Uh-huh, okay. um, a classic story, the source of which I cannot find. The rest of these come from an excellent book by Bill Crow, a book called jazz anecdotes, but this first one, I don't know where this comes from. I couldn't find the source for it. I think it involves Sidney Bechet, the legendary clarinetist and and saxophonist of the early days of jazz. And he was performing on stage one time. And I believe this is down in New Orleans. And uh, a young player kind of crept on stage to try his hand against the master Mm -hmm. in a cutting contest. And uh, Bechet didn't, he he booked no tolerance for this and he blew him off the stage in just a few bars. I mean, just destroyed the guy in in a cutting contest where he could even get started. So the kid uh, tried to sneak off the stage and out a side door. So Bechet promptly swung around, followed him down off the stage, out the door (laughs) and down the street, clarinetting at him all the way. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Left the venue. (laughs) Yes. I don't know if that's true or not, but, but uh I love that story. And so that's the spirit of of some of the jazz anecdotes that I'm going to be sharing from Bill Crow's book tonight. I'm going to start with Ellington. Uh, Duke Ellington's various orchestras, and he held a, he held a working big band together for decades. And in the, you know, the war years, as, as you know, Brian, you're a jazz guy too. I mean, masterpieces just tumbled out of that band. Uh, um, Harlem Airshaft and Coco and all these great songs came out of, of the Ellington orchestras, but it was also full of a lot of guys who liked to pull pranks. And apparently uh, trombonist Juan Tizal was one of the worst 
who once in a performance actually lit a stink bomb on stage. <laughs> and uh, when the rest of the band found out who did it, the next night they took his tuxedo and put itching powder all in his tuxedo and all of his clothes. And the next night he lasted about halfway through the first number before he ran off straight stage scratching and cursing. <laughs> um, Bonnie Bar- uh, Barney Bigert, who was a clarinetist, got tired of someone stealing his whiskey when he was taking naps. So one day he he faked a nap and Junior Ragland, who was a bassist, snuck up and took his whiskey bottle uncapped and took a huge swig. And just then Bigard sat up and said, now I hope you know what you just did. And he he had basically a mouthful of urine. Urine. (laughs) Yeah, I can can see that one coming. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Rex Stewart had a similar problem where his stash of whiskey was being drained dry. So he replaced it for the next night without saying a word. And it was chugged prior to a performance by several of the other orchestra members who found out during their set that Stewart had laced the whiskey with castor oil. Oh, God. You know what castor oil does? Uh, yeah. Makes you Every, everybody out. <laughs> Cootie Williams trumpeter said, oh, what a time we had on the stand that night. A couple more trumpet players, Freddie Jenkins and Artie Wetzel, uh, fell would fall prey to instrument sabotage. Jenkins... <laughs> Jenkins found out in the middle of a set that his mouthpiece had been smeared with Limburger cheese and cayenne pepper. <laughs> <laughs> and someone once took uh, Wetzel's trumpet apart and turned the valves around backwards. So he, when he pressed the valves down, no sound came out. <laughs> so he gets up to take a solo and it's just nothing. And he's shaking his trumpet and Ellington is just staring him down. Um. Billy Holiday, the great vocalist Billy Holiday, and I don't listen to a lot of vocal jazz, but I've got a couple of Billy Holiday collections that are really tremendous. And she tells the story of a craps game on a bus ride from West Virginia to New York. She was down to her last four dollars and she proceeded to get into a craps game in the back of the bus. Where by the time they got to New York, she, quote, was filthy, dirty, had holes in the knees of her stockings, but sixteen hundred dollars in change in her pocket. (laughs) shit she gave 30, she gave 30 she pounds gave the, huh? yeah, she gave the bulk of the money to her mother who eventually put that money to good use and started a restaurant called mom holidays um vibraphonist terry gibbs uh, the vibraphone's another instrument i never really appreciated until i got into uh guys like bobby hutcherson and, and so forth uh terry gibbs and uh so Jason Jason Marsalis is a vibraphonist, but he was invited to share the stage. Uh, Terry Gibbs was he was decide he was invited to share band leader Buddy Rich, the great drummer. Uh, Buddy Rich said, "Hey, come along and why don't you take a ride with me?" And so they got in his Cadillac rather than ride the tour bus. And he said that Buddy Rich drove very very fast. And each night Terry would run off a list of the guys in the band he thought should take solos. And the very next gig there'd be no solos. So after about a week of this, Buddy stops the car in the middle of the desert and says, wait a minute, I've had enough of this shit. You've been telling me how to run my band for a week. Get out, take the bus. And he kicked him out in the middle of the desert and took off. And he'd been driving so fast, Gibbs had to wait over two hours for the trailing bus to catch up. (laughs) Violinist Stuff Smith. Another thing we don't think about jazz violin is Stefan Grappelli, Stuff Smith, a couple others, once bought a brand new LaSalle from a car dealer in Chicago and he wrecked it driving out of the showroom. (laughs) He promptly went right back in and bought a second one. And on the next tour of Chicago, the band was taking requests and someone from the audience handed a slip of paper, which turned out to be a summons for the first car. Uh, He just left it there in the street. The whole band's wages were garnished. (laughs) Uh, Pianist Claude Thornhill, who also ran an orchestra, pulled something pretty interesting during a tour they were traveling through arizona so he stopped the bus and had the entire orchestra line up and play chords into the grand canyon they stood for a long while and listened to all of the echoes bouncing back and forth and in due course a huge crowd of listeners surrounded them (laughs) could you imagine visiting (laughs) the grand canyon and this jazz orchestra just trops along and starts playing as loudly as they can uh uh, baritone saxophonist Serge Shaloff was a menace, particularly on hotel rooms and hotel managers. He would often burn three foot long holes in mattresses because he would fall asleep smoking. 
but then he would uh, he would berate the manager when they would try to when they would try to get him to pay for it. You'd say things like, "How dare you talk to me that way? I happen to be the downbeat and metronome pole winner." And eventually, <laughs> the manager ended up apologizing to him. Uh, one particular manager didn't put up with the nonsense. He demanded that Shal- Shaloff pay him after the musician decided to have target practice with a pistol in his hotel room, <laughs> shooting holes through the door. The manager de- demanded a payment of $24. So he paid him and then had vibraphonist Terry Gibbs from earlier. He mm-hmm. had him, he had him remove the door and carry it to the tour bus because he paid for it. And he <laughs> considered for it, it his. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Alto saxophonist Phil Woods would teach jazz classes and what he would like what he liked to do once a year is he would take the al the a lab band ensemble i guess that's like the the starting starting lineup basically he'd get them in the parking lot with all their instruments uniforms music sheets and equipment and he'd make him pack the bus he would close all the blinds and this is a quote and just drive around the campus for eight hours (laughs) they would get out get dressed set up the equipment pick out a set and tune up then they would put everything away and wouldn't play at all. He'd make them change clothes, <laughs> repack the bus, close the blind, blinds and drive them around for another eight hours. And then he'd stop the bus at the end and say, all right, who wants to do this for a living? Cause this is what it is. <laughs> God, that, that's, that's being committed to a joke. <laughs> Alto saxophonist, Jimmy Ford. And he was a, uh, I believe he was a Texas saxophonist and they're a different breed altogether. He once yelled at, yelled at a baritone saxophone player, hey, give me a reed. And so the guy handed him a reed, but he had no idea how Ford was going to use it on his alto sax because his right. reed was for a baritone yeah, it's sax. It's like twice the size. Then. Right. So Ford pulled out a small cup of ice cream and used the reed as a scoop to eat his ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Roy Eldridge, trumpeter. I just heard Roy Eldridge tune driving around the car tonight. He liked to mess with the mm-hmm. other, other trumpet players, by he, he'd act like he was drunk. And he'd wait for young gun, some young gun to call him up to the stage for a cutting contest. And he'd promptly sober up real quick and quote, get up and blow everybody out of the building. Mm. Uh, <laughs> vibraphonist Terry Gibbs was sharing an instrument with Milt Jackson during a radio broadcast. They would take turns performing numbers. So Jackson went first. Then he disconnected the damper bar from the pedal so Gibbs couldn't sustain notes during his performance. (laughs) Basically playing a xylophone, I think. So before Jackson's next number, Gibbs moved all of the bars in the front row, one slot to the left. So all the the flats and sharps were messed up. And Gibbs was quoted as saying, didn't do any good. He still played better than me. (laughs) Uh, Trombonist Jack Rains who ran into a contractor, a music contractor who's doing scores for films at a bar needed a bass trombonist, which I didn't even know was a thing. So Reigns was the only trombonist in the bar. And he said, I need you to play some bass trombone on a date starting in half an hour. And Reigns responded, I'm sorry, I don't play bass trombone. Well, I'll rent one for you. Okay. And Reigns says, sure. While you're at it, rent me an alto sax. I don't play that either. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Guitarist Eddie Condon and drummer George Wetling played for the Artie Shaw band together. And they had to wear uniforms that had a really pair of ugly shoes. In order to save uniform expenses, the men shared a pair of shoes. At the same time, Ernie Condon, at one point in the performance, I had to stand up, put my right foot on a chair and play a 16 bar solo. Otherwise, both of my feet were hidden behind a music stand. Wetling's right foot was hidden by his bass drum and his left was visible to the audience. <laughs> yeah. So we shared a pair of brown spade atrocities. <laughs> George wore the left one. I wore the right one. Um, the And I'm going to close with this, this fella, because he, uh, he kind of takes it back to your, one of your um, topics from an earlier episode. The Biddy Goodman Orchestra had its own Yogi Berra with Italian-born saxophonist Vito, that's V-I-D-O, Vito Musso. Vito had a loose grasp of the English language. And uh, on the bus rides between gigs, the fellows in the band would play a game where someone would give the initials of a band leader and the others had to guess who that was. So when it came time for Vito, Vito said E-C. So the guys guessed Ernie Condon, shook his head no. Emil Coleman, shook his head no this went on for a while and they finally gave up and they said Vito who you're talking about and he said EC Xavier Kugat (laughs) close enough (laughs) 
another time he's on a tour bus and he desperately needed some fresh air. So he yelled out, if somebody don't open a window right now, we'll all get sophisticated. <laughs> and as a means mm. to wrap it up, because I think this is perfect mm. because of someone who admires mm. jazz from afar, I think Vito is wrong in what he's saying, but he's absolutely right in the spirit. Once he was overheard in a conversation saying to a fellow musician, music is a very hard instrument. <laughs> Sources for this piece were the NPR Curious Listener's Guide to Jazz by Lauren Schonenberg, Jazz Anecdotes by Bill Crow, A Plus E Interactive, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. That's from the Bay Area Entertainment blog, and it was an interview with Nicholas Payton and Wikipedia for other other uh, information. So there you go. Stories from the jazz world. Nice. And, uh, Very good. What, what those guys did to entertain themselves on the road. And that brings us to our middle break, right, Brian, which is the. It, we are indeed. And we're, we're going to, we're going to do something a little different because normally Brian presents it. So here we go. It's time for the dream idiots curse word of the week. So Brian. Mm -hmm. here, here's the curse word of the week. Jazz. <laughs> Huh. Uh, so it has some has a, has a second meaning besides the style of music. I have no idea. Well, uh, Schoenberg's NPR Curious Listener's Guide to Jazz says that jazz was quote a problematic word from the beginning. <laughs> it derives from the word jazz, J A S S, uh -huh. which is an implication of excitement, energy, and vitality. Some folks that have argued that jazz is derived from jassm, J-A-S-M, which itself is a variant of jism or jizz, meaning mm -hmm. semen. It's also <laughs> curious that these coincide with another word that combines energy with male bodily fluid, which is spunk. Spunk is in the same vein, believe it or not. Now, some early folks in the music scene wanted to call uh wanted, wanted to, call, to call jazz spunk. <laughs> no, no, no. They wanted to call it something entirely different. Duke Ellington mm -hmm. argued that we shouldn't be calling it jazz, we should be calling it American Negro music. That never caught on. But modern trumpet player Nicholas Payton prefers have you heard about what he prefers to call it? No, uh. Okay. He prefers the word BAM, B A M, which stands for black American music. His argument is that is is that jazz music is is a problematic term because it's it's a way to i think he sees it as being have, having been uh i don't want to say corrupted but uh he feels that bam gets to the heart of the matter better with right the without any, any sort of negative affiliation yeah yeah, back, uh, yeah i kind of like that actually yeah and some some other folks have taken that on uh with with what they call jazz i still use jazz because that's the word that uh, i've always learned so there you go curse word right. of the week jazz jazz wow okay nice what you got for us this week brian all right well we are we are moving on here uh i'm going to tell you uh, a story this week about a man named billy Barr. um if you google this man's name uh, and he is he's definitely Googleable, and it'll say very, very clearly that he prefers lowercase b, i l l y, lowercase b, a r r. This is not the bloviated former a g, but uh, a different individual. Um, this you know, as of as of our recording, Billy is now probably about uh, seventy years old or so. And Billy grew up in uh, New Jersey. As a shy, skinny kid, uh, he was in st studying environmental science at Rutgers University, but his life in New Jersey wasn't going quite as he liked it. He was looking for some isolation and some quiet, and the bustle of sort of a bigger city existence was frankly leaving him borderline depressed. And so he decided to, to travel west. Uh, so he left, he dropped out of college in 1973 and headed his way to your neck of the word, your, your neck of the woods, uh, Gothic, Colorado. And in 73, he, um, you know, 
started living basically at the base of Gothic Mountain. And Gothic Mountain is this 12,600 foot high structure. It looks it looks vaguely like uh, El Capitan in, in some of the pictures. And uh, in the winters, he was living in uh, this tiny little shack uh, in a this little eight by 10, um, you know, outbuilding basically old old spare building he had uh roommates that were a skunk and a pine martin and uh, a pine martin is basically a it's kind of an american weasel basically uh and they were his only only company for much of the year uh but he moved out there because he uh precisely because he wanted uh solitude he wanted quiet he wanted a different type of life but he was also an inquisitive person exceptionally bright uh, and he couldn't escape the boredom of um, of his you know, of his time uh, in the mountains. His first winter there, he he started to um, measure snow levels, and so twice a day he would go outside and measure how much snow had fallen during the night, and then twelve hours later he would measure the amount of snow that had fallen during the day, and he'd start keeping track. Uh, and in addition to this, he would. Uh, note animal tracks he would make a note of when certain mammals were coming out of hibernation and he became fairly adept at identifying bird calls and when various other animals were in the area and he could he could hear them and he started taking notes of all these various observations in this in this it was standard little binder and uh he would fill up of one, up one binder which took three years and then, he, then he'd move on to the next binder and he's been doing this now for 50 years um he's still there so he is um you know he's just an amateur scientist but he became closely affiliated with with what's called the rocky mountain biological laboratory and i'll keep referring to it as the rmbl through the rest of this uh and so during the last couple of decades this facility has become really at the forefront of sort of climate science uh and you know when it started back in the 70s it was frankly it sort of seemed like it was a bit of a slapdash kind of run like a non-profit all hands on deck sort of um facility where uh you know people had to wash the dishes and if you backed up the toilet you had probably had to plunge it yourself and you know that sort of approach but they they, they didn't have much you know many records on hand at the time but they were looking into uh you know flora and fauna and different types of flowers and when they bloomed and and um how you know, how the timing of this, um, of these flowers and when they bloomed impacted bugs and birds and butterflies and, and these types of things. Uh, and so this has evolved over time. The site of the RMBL is, uh, is a ghost town. So this was an area that was heavily mined for silver for about 10 years in the, the very tail end of the 19th century. So, so about 1880 to 1890, 1892, silver is being pulled out of the mountain and then the silver kind of runs dry. The place is abandoned. They go, you know, start digging silver out of, of mines that are more productive. And so there is, you know, this building that winds up being his home, at least initially, was an outbuilding for this mine that was, you know, that was when he gets there, uh, you know, nearly 100 years old, 90 years old. Uh, in 1928, a that's when a first uh, biology, uh, biology professor comes to the area and basically starts building up this facility and what they sort of deem this summer pilgrimage of scientists. And, um, you know, it's every summer for, for three months, there's this ragtag group of folks that are doing research and they're sharing mess halls and it's students working, you know, doing internships with professors. And again, it's this, this sort of mix of folks doing research very, very broadly on things tied to environmental science and conservation. One of the guys who is there at, at this time as well, early 70s, uh, is an ecologist named uh, David Inouye. And we'll come back to David here in a moment. So uh, the same year that Barr comes to this area and becomes Gothic's only permanent resident, um, this is when Inouye, at the same time, <laughs> Inouye is studying all these wild, wildflowers. And his, his focus is on um, flowers and how they and how they impact the, you know, the local area. He has 30 plots of flowers in this area. Uh, and he really, really is, is trying to determine how these flowering plants and how they're evolving over time are basically are affecting the, the general ecology of 
the broader areas is was basically what he's trying to wrap his wrap his brain around um when Barr is first there, for, for at least initially, he has um, he lives for the first winter. He lives in a tent. Uh, he's roughing it. Gothic is about ten miles away from the nearest town that actually had any supplies. It's actually completely unreachable except by ski during winter. Uh, so he lived in the tent for, for, for as long as he could. Then moved over to this eight by ten mining shack, and the only reason Barr winds up in this shack in this you know in this cabin is by a lucky lucky chance and a, and a problem with a a messy chain of title basically the rmbl is convinced that the cabin belonged to the u.s forest service the u.s forest service was convinced it belonged to the rmbl <laughs> um, uh, there's a local man in the area who also claimed it was his and so in this weird sort of triangle of confusion no one could really lay claim to it and so Barr just took it over so that first full winter when he's there, all he does is get up before daybreak, goes, you know, he, I'm sure he eats, you know, if you're, if you were living full time in winter at uh, Gothic is at 9,500 feet, your, your, your caloric intake must be staggering. Uh, so gets up, eats a big breakfast, skis out in the woods, finds a dead tree, cuts it down, hauls it back, cuts it up. You know, he's stockpiling, getting exercise, but also stockpiling as much wood as he um, possibly can. And, um, <laughs> but this is, this is when he starts doing this research and he says, quote, under, under kerosene light, you can't do much. But after a few years, I had something to compare each winter with. This is when he starts going out every morning and taking these detailed notes in these ledgers of not only the, the amount of snowfall twice a day, but also he would measure the snows, uh, basically it's density, it's volume. And so he would, he would take these notes, uh, as well. So he's compiling these notes. Uh, and during the course of the winter, for many, many years, he's there by himself during the winter. And then a, a random group of folks show up during the summer to do you know more work. In the summer months, he would come down out of the, out of the mountain and work odd jobs. He would uh, one summer worked fighting wildfires on a, on a hot shot crew. He would wash dishes in the RMBL's kitchen. Um, the RMBL itself was... You know, you and I spent time at Ghost Ranch last year. It's yep. kind, of, kind of that vibe of a oh, bit okay. of a non yeah. nonprofit kind of, um, you know, you kind of have to kind of take care of your own stuff probably. Um, and, you know, everything is a little bit probably slipshod. No one's keeping track of bills and, you know, general upkeep was probably disastrous and especially upkeep <clears throat> at with so much snow at elevation with shitty access. It's got to be got to be hard. And so he's there year round. He becomes the unofficial caretaker for the place. So he, so when, when weather's bad, he shuts, shuts off pipes. So things don't freeze. He's eyeballing research equipment in return for his sort of year round service. The lab gives him access to a car. So he can occasionally drive down. Gotha, Colorado is, is immediately North of Crested Butte by only like 20 miles. Uh, so it's basically between Crested Butte and the area where Maroon Bell's, and you know not far from snowmass aspen which i know you do right. very very well mm -hmm. um but you can't you can't drive I mean, there's um oh it's know. close but it's not close <laughs> right yeah right it's 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 close as as the shit's long but it's not you know whatever um and uh but it's a long way around uh so it's that that part of um the state so um he's able to take care of himself reasonably well he does have access to a car uh he was always a bit of a numbers guy when he was growing up, he was big into baseball. He would, um, you know, take notes and keep detailed baseball stats on his favorite players. Pl favorite players. Hopefully, he wasn't a Yankees fan, but he probably was. Uh, and then early '80s, the guy who was the uh, director of the RMBL found out that Barr was good at numbers. Suggested Barr take um, an accounting class, which he did. And then in the early 1980s, Barr also becomes the lab's accountant. Um, and so um, by early 80s, Barr has moved out of the 8x10 shack, builds his own home uh, up in the mountains as well, about a half mile from where the lab is located in Gothic. He has solar panels. He has a greenhouse for vegetables. Apparently, weirdly, I don't, I don't get why this would be the case for anyone who's American. He is a big, big fan of both Bollywood films and cricket. Uh, and so those, the, so he has a little small home theater and that's, that's how he spends it. That's what he loves to watch. Like, yeah, that's, right. 
<laughs> right? Sign of mental disease, I guess. I don't know. Um, as he's gotten older, he's got, you know, become more relaxed on people. And it's it's not like he's in complete social isolation year round. He does have several months where he is where he is in town and he is around people a little bit. There are there are a few interviews um, with, with him, and if you've ever seen an interview with like Ted Kaczynski, you know any any of those guys that were for some reason, Brian, he's been on my mind the entire time you've been talking. <laughs> really? Well, th- those guys that are the hardcore loners, when they when you do finally have, see an interview with them, they are stiff and they are stressed and they are awkward and they can't look at you um, because they've had they've lived in such profound isolation. This guy is the exact opposite. He obviously likes he's a bit of an introvert and likes solitude and quiet, but he's this warm sort of winsome, gentle guy. Who's very, very friendly and, and quite um, just very content and at ease. He's not stressed at all, but he's, I guess he just likes being by himself. Uh, if, you know, again, if you Google him, he's, he's in a couple of documentaries and there are several things of him on YouTube as well. He's a you know, really winsome, interesting kind of has a sort of silly persona about him, which is sort of um, interesting. So when, when he was much younger, he, he may have been a little more stiff or awkward. Uh, in this article, where most of this research came from was from uh, Atlantic Monthly. This article uh, mentions the fact that one year he he decided to ski down into town to see a play at a local theater. And when he arrived, he was the only person in the audience. And the play's director wanted to call it off, but then everyone realized it was Barr who was who was seated there because they reckon, <laughs> they reckon the, he had he has a long sort of Gandalf beard, and he is string bean skinny. He's a really really thin thin guy, and so when they realized it was him, and he's this local legend sort of, they decided to put the play on anyway just for him. Um, and he's also I, mean, I judge even to this day he's still the RMBL's accountant. Uh, and he, when he's there, he, I guess he must sit up front somewhere. So people, you know, he's, he's recognizable. People know who he is. Uh, and apparently he keeps like a hidden stash of candy, chocolate candy. And so when people, when people can't come in, he hands them little, little chocolate bars. And so, uh, and so he's just this really weird, but revered, uh, character in this town all, all this while now, 45 plus years, uh, at his home above the lab he has been taking all of these notes every single day each stenographer's notebook uh, lasts for three years and as he's taking these notes he's not he has no academic training in any of this whatsoever he developed his own code uh for the different things he was he was keeping track of in the morning and night he goes out snow levels monitors the weather monitors temperature he's monitoring wildlife um so um he has these notations in red where and when, you, when he sees mammals coming out from hibernation uh first calls for spring from robins from the flickers uh and then um there's one bird a bird called the broad-tailed hummingbird which was a bird that um that in a way was especially interested in and focused on because they're they're monitoring this bird and 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 it's timing to the area uh in terms of when it feeds on this particular flower called a glacier lily uh and all this is tied to basically to global warming so this data set uh in bar has lived in the area um for you know basically forever uh bar and in a way get to know each other at least a little bit in passing in a way is only there during the summer but they become at least passing friends it isn't until the 1990s that in a way in a passing conversation and apparently neither one of them recall having this conversation but at some point there's the realization that Barr has been collecting data for 25 years and in a way he's like you've been doing what yeah um i want to see your data and so starting in the 90s Barr starts sharing all of this climate data and in a way is quoted as saying i realized right away what a valuable treasure it was uh, I knew what type of thing could be done with access to this type of historical record. B- Billy Barr's notes, uh, now spanning close to 50 years, are so exhaustive in their detail that they now have appeared in dozens of research papers focused on climate change science, basically. He has you know notes on the first snow of the year and last snow of the year, snowpack levels in between. Um, this this staggering level of things and he, and he just did this 
to not be bored basically <laughs> um and it's obviously it's you know irrefutable that obviously climate change is real but if you're trying to enact public policy or trying to you know create change you can't you have to have data to back it up there's a woman who's a, a hydrologist named rosemary carroll uh, she works at the desert research institute and she used um, bars snowpack data and a bunch of other sources to model groundwater flow uh, in the colorado area colorado river area because where you live and like 40 million other people rely on river water and you know snow runoff Mm-hmm. as their only source of water uh and it's the data that billy barr has collected for all these decades that basically now is shaping water policy for dozens of southwestern cities i i guess you know maybe everywhere but certainly on the east facing side of the rocky mountains in colorado the front range yeah yeah, yeah. colorado and, and new mexico i guess um in a way has, has included uh, bars records in, in a bunch of studies uh and um you know it's just a, a staggering amount of um uh, of data and work and now apparently bars main job he's still collecting data but now instead of um rewriting it copiously in these little notebooks he is typing his data into spreadsheets and he's also transcribing all of his old uh all these old notebooks into spreadsheets as well so they're more easily shareable um so back to the uh in a way and the the hummingbird um that he was um he was so interested in that glacier lily um blooms at a, at a you know certain time of year and the hummingbird comes through this part of colorado basically within days of when this flower blooms because the climate is warming, the lily is is now flowering earlier and earlier. Now it now it flowers seventeen days earlier than it did four decades ago, and in twenty years they speculate that this bird will completely miss the glacier lily's nectar completely, uh, and therefore the bird will have to go somewhere else completely. This may seem like a, I don't know, a incredibly microscopic data point. But I find that incredibly interesting that they have this information and they're able to now plug this into this brighter, broader context of what is going to, you know, going to be happening in this area and other areas, you know, presumably going forward by virtue of the fact that, that, you know, the climate is changing folks and, uh, and we are to blame. Wow. So anyway, incredibly interesting uh guy he's in a couple documentaries um he's still living apparently in that cabin he is in uh in this article it says a not yet released documentary this article from atlantic monthly came out in january of 2017 uh principal source you know atlantic monthly uh, article article written by jay weston fippen so end of snow is one documentary which i have not watched not watched there is another documentary, which is really, really short, called Snow Guardian, which he is in. Uh, and he's sort of funny and hilarious. There's, you know, he's in this video. Um, they, they made him basically model all of his winter hats. And he's just kind of being silly. And doing this, <laughs> like, um, but this really winsome, interesting, you know, intelligent dude. Um, and, uh, you know, living up in the mountains, collecting all this data. Sometimes he's, he's given, uh, you know, he's cited as a source. Sometimes his data is, is just you know, pilfered and he's not given recognition. I mean, you know, he doesn't really seem to care as far as I can tell, uh, in the, in the, in the snow guardian documentary, the, one of the, one of the directors toward the, the, uh, very end, uh, asks him, I think uh, intending this to be a more, br- more broad piece of advice, but asks him, you know, do you have any, do you have any advice you'd like, you'd like to share? Uh, and he's talking about skiing, but this seems to apply to life in general. Billy Barr's uh, it, general advice is: if you're going to fall, fall on your butt, not on your face. I mean, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, good enough. <laughs> if you go to um, Gotha, Colorado, there is now the Billy Barr Community Center, which is tied to the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Um, and apparently, he's still hanging out there, and he, he's he wanders through town apparently occasionally uh, in in summer months. And if you well, want to see him in winter, winter, you probably can't. 
we're uh we go to Crested Butte every now and then, so I'll have to kick around down there and see see what I can see. Um yeah, that's I, I got a few thoughts on that. I mean, one, it shows that you can be brilliant and live in a cabin and not bomb people, which I think is great. Right. Um, because Ted Kaczynski obviously resonates with this because Kaczynski is like concerned with the effects of technology in the modern world. That's what his manifesto is all about. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um and also just the impressive ability of an autodidact to do what he's done, to basically teach himself data collection like that, where people typically go to school and take two or three years right. to do that kind of stuff. That is, that's just amazing. And he's just been doing this because, uh, and then it turned into something else. That's remarkable. Yeah, I mean, for 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 our entire life. I mean, I was born in 1970. <laughs> so shortly after I was born, he started this, and he's still doing it. That level of sort of myopic focus, I am sort of stunned by because I don't have it. <laughs> no, that I mean, that's incredible. Um, so that just by itself, but then the fact that it would become such a, a vital component to apparently so many other projects and initiatives and um you know tied to public policy essentially is is super interesting that, that it would just be a kind of a happy happy accident i guess but um amazing that just you know this random dude started you know wanted to do this and the whole glacier lily thing and, and the hummingbirds missing it because they keep changing because the, it keeps changing uh -huh. I, I got to admit that's how i feel when i come to texas and i've missed the green chili cheese water burger <laughs> um <laughs> you know just missing missing it by that much that's, damn it <laughs> that's amazing that's good stuff brian that gives us a little hope right that, that's a hopeful episode after what, what we've been putting each other through lately yeah so yeah and next next time next summer when i'm when i'm when i'm you know next time th next summer <laughs> <laughs> when i'm thinner and fitter when I'm, I'm gonna wander but wander up to because at one point you and i talk about going to maroon bells although um apparently that <laughs> in a straight line it's like four miles but the drive i'm sure must be 100 yeah. miles to go all the way around yeah because you i think you'd have to come around the back side to get into uh to uh come in from aspen on the other side of the yeah. of the town yeah um that makes sense if you <laughs> how's that for direction giving folks that's 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 great <laughs> just turn um, left at the at the dead possum <laughs> see the mountain in front of you turn left there <laughs> well cool there you go mr billy Barr, the good one the good Billy. yes Barr. Mm -hmm. yes indeed well uh thanks for listening folks thanks for your rates and reviews got a story about jazz musicians today a little news catch up on uh, a particularly brutal form what's shaping up to be a brutal form of execution and a nice story about a self-taught environmentalist. It's, that's a nice, that's a nice round. Uh, keeping, keeping it varied. Compliment of, of subjects, Brian. Yeah. So thanks for listening folks. Uh, like, and subscribe and uh, give us five stars on whatever platform you're listening on. You can actually now listen to us just on our website, dreammediates.com. And there are links to the merch and, um, instagram etc so we're out there reach out to us at dream idiots podcast at gmail and we will be back again very soon be good to each other <laughs>